a disability services manual, you know, whether it's a physical disability, a, a cognitive disability, there are some disabilities that are not very obvious. In the paper you sent me, you, dis you mentioned partnerships that your organization conducts with other agencies. Can you pick one or two or three that you think bear mentioning and tell us a little bit about it, about that? You know, one of the things is we try to create several different partnerships. You know, um, one that I could probably speak of is um, waste management. And certainly not speaking on waste management's behalf. Um, you know, it was a partnership where sometimes you just have to ask the right question. You know, so it's like, well, what can Goodwill and waste management do together? And you know, and what we, was the answer? Well, the answer is it's simple. Um, our, our, our business model kind of falls around our stores and our donation centers, and that's what people mostly know. That's what I knew right? before I thought of meeting well, you. My tagline is that we're more than a store, we're more than a donation center. And the reason that I say that is, one, as a part of our mission, we are providing services to people who otherwise may not have those services provided. So as we're helping people uh, achieve their highest levels of personal and economic independence, it's through our training programs that we're able to do those things. And so, that's funded by the thrift stores? Uh, over 65% of our revenue is generated from our thrift stores. So with waste management and partnering with them, so let's say that they have their bulky item, the bulky item pickups. So instead of sending that stuff to the landfill, some of that stuff is probably still in good condition, you know, or salvageable condition. And so what we'll do with waste management is that stuff that is in fact salvageable, they basically are donating it to us and we're, you know, the stuff that we can actually uh, salvage and sell through our stores, we'll put it in our stores. So we're recycling and putting it right back out into the community. Why should the general public care what Goodwill does? I've been asked that question before too, and I've mirrored that question by asking why shouldn't they care? And the reason I, mi I mirror that question is because a lot of people, again, just know about our donation centers and our stores, which are great. You know, but we've been around since 1902, and we were really truly founded on the principles of providing services to people, and we've been doing that ever since. So why should people care? Because whenever you're able to go to one of our stores, you're not paying the same price for the stuff that you will still see in a big department store. It may be gently used and it's being recycled, but it's the same material. It's the same blouse, it's the same shirt, it's the same pair of pants. It's just been passed along. The quality is still there. How does it impact me, the services you provide to disabled people? I think it automatically and should impact you because it gives you a different sense of knowledge. You know, because we all know that ignorance is void of knowledge, void of education, void of information. And what you know or what you thought you knew about Goodwill that our donation centers and our stores to come here and to visit with us and see some of the people that we work with will just absolutely blow your mind. Because you'll say, and I, I give tours of our facility all the time, you'll hear, you will, you will say yourself, I, I'll ha I had no idea. You know, we, we, we provided a service to over 10,000 people last year. We were able to place over 600 into competitive employment last year. So, a physical disability on placing you into competitive employment, or whether, you know, for example, we were able to place um, some of the people that we're working with at a, in an enclave setting, where we may have three or four of them going to the going to the same job, doing the same thing every single day, and they're having oversight from what we consider a, a job coach or an employment training specialist to making sure that they're meeting the employer's needs. So it really does. We we really run the gambit. The people that we deal with. We never focus on what their disability is. We always focus on what their abilities are. And that's, that's key. What else can John Q. Public do for Goodwill other than donate clothes or furniture or such to you or buy something from your thrift store? Everyone can open their minds and their hearts to dealing with people with disabilities in general. So for here, for me, I know that I would say if you're an employer, consider hiring someone who has a disability. You know, because I know that we go through the entire vetting process to make sure that we are placing the right people in the right jobs. So what will accrue to my viewer who's an employer from hiring someone 
from you. And so what would a... What, what would accrue to the employer as opposed to just going through Craigslist and taking whatever comes? You know, sometimes there's just that corporate... Being a good corporate citizen always helps. And if I could take someone who has a disability and give them a chance where society or another company otherwise wouldn't, I'm missing out on a, a great opportunity. Because we've been able to place people into uh, different types of employment settings, and they've been there for years. You know, one of the things I always say is that sometimes all people need is a chance, disabled or otherwise. They just need a pr chance to prove that they can do it or not do it. That's part of life is that experience of successes and failures, you know, disability or not. What's the first service project you remember being involved in in your life? First service project, Plainview, Texas, there was a runaway hotline. You know, and I can still see the ad that said first in the nation. We were on top of this huge billboard. We had to climb up the pole, and, and they were the, uh, uh, the installers were just putting it up. Um, it says runaway hotline, you know, going through Plainview, Texas. And it was for teenagers. So that was the first. Um, what did you do? And we were there to answer phone calls. So it's kind of like being teens, being teens for teens, so to speak. Was it through your church or not? No, it was it wasn't through church. Um, if I remember correctly, it had something to do with. I was also part of this uh, thing called Teen Court, where if you were a teenager and you had some type of a traffic infraction, then you would come to Teen Court, and then you would literally be judged by you know a group of your peers. There would be teenagers, you know, and so you would end usually, if I remember correctly, we would t typically end up with X amount of community hours. And from that, the judge who was doing that, you know, asked me if I'd be a part of that particular project. So, see, the teen court came first, so the hotline came first. I've slept since then. Was there a moment when you knew that service was going to be a major part of your life? Was it, it doesn't have to be Saul on the road to Damascus, but some kind of epiphany? No, it's, I've always been the, that helpful person. And I don't know where it came from. I, I think it's just ingrained in me. It's just, that's just who I am. You know, and a lot of times people ask, well, how did you go from being a Marine to doing what you're doing? You know, because... It does you seem incongruous. Of, right, right. But you think of... Marines are still human. You know, we still have hearts. You know, we're not those, that total hard ass that people, you know, think that we are. We're, we're human beings. Do you have a particular spiritual practice? No. And I and I, I had to think about that because you know I I, I find myself oftentimes praying. That's know, a spiritual and, practice. And it, I guess it's not in the normal sense of you know I'm on my knees every night I'm on my knees every morning because sometimes I'll just be riding and just whisper a quick prayer. You know, so <clears throat> a normal practice. I, well, let me back up. A prayer is my normal practice, my normal spiritual practice. Because sometimes it just come in the it, it just hit me that I may need to just whisper, you know, send a little something up at that moment. I'm going to describe two hypothetical viewers to you. Okay. One of them is educated, financially well off, they're socially busy in their life. They could be married with kids or not, but they're very, very busy in their life. they got a lot going on. Okay. The other person is someone who's maybe not educated. Maybe they're struggling in their life. Maybe they're even serially unemployed. Okay. It's all they can do to get dinner on the table each day. Neither of these two people has ever done anything for anyone or anything outside of their own narrowly defined self-interest. They might include their family in their self-interest, but other than that, nothing. Okay. I speak to them either together or separately. Why would they want to be of service to something outside of themselves? Let me speak to the person that doesn't really have anything. That no matter how bad your situation is, there's always someone in a worse off situation. So if you see that man or woman on the street that may need that dime or that quarter, it could be that quarter to call home to get them off the street. You know, to that person that has it all, open up your heart. Because you never know when you may find yourself in that same situation. If they follow your advice, but they're still afraid, they're, they're cautious, they're, they're interested, but they're cautious. They want to get their toesies wet mm -hmm. before they bite off the whole apple. 
can you recommend an entry-level non-threatening service project that they might do? This is assuming that these people may uh, belong to a, a church. Okay. That's that's uh, a valid assumption. Right, absolutely. So there's always the daycare if they have children to volunteer time at the daycare. Um, volunteer time in Bible study. Volunteer time, you know, at their, at their local church or whatever organization. Or uh, there are a number of service clubs that, they're at, that are out there, whether it's uh, Rotary, Kiwanis Clubs. Um, if they have children, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. So there are a number of different ways to get their toes wet uh, before they actually immerse themselves in the spirit of, of servitude, so to speak. What other service projects are you currently involved in other than your employment here at Goodwill? Oh, geez. I am on the uh, Orange County Human Relations Commission. And tell us what that is briefly. All right. The Orange County Human Relations Commission basically basically exists to help combat racism, anti-Semitism, um, stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. It's really all about helping you live free or fuller lives in Orange County, hopefully free of those things. Is there a project that you've worked on with them that seems particularly meaningful? I've been involved with the organization for a number of years, and the things that we do with the uh, walk in my shoes, and you were talking and dealing and what with, is that? Uh, dealing with high school kids. You know, and I've spoken at this event on a few different uh, a few different occasions, and sometimes given your my own individual perspective, not just as an African American, but as an African American male, you know, sometimes that's a different perspective on life. You know, or just being able to help people be in an in an environment that's safe, and they can ask some of those questions. You know, like why why is your hair that way? You know, or why are your lips fuller than than mine? You know, a lot of times people are afraid to ask some of those questions because they may find it offensive. And that's a part of walking in my shoes. You know, and you've been able to share that with the kids as to, or with adults even for that matter, as to, you know, we have, we all, we're all different. You know, but we should be able to enjoy each other's differences, have that mutual respect for each other's differences, because my background, my experience is completely different than your background, sure. your experience, right. man, man to man. Even just our male experiences are different. You know, you were in the Navy, I was in the Marine Corps. As far as the the Woolies, I'm probably the highest educated of that of that group. And you know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm with the 100 Black Men of Orange County. What do they do? Um, our particular chapter is real big on mentorship. You know, we take young African American uh, men, um, high school age, and we mentor them. And we, our ultimate goal is that we are turning out socially conscious and responsible young men. So it's all about uh, making that transition from young adulthood into manhood. You know, and those things. It's not about just coming of age. You know, the days of old, it's about mastery. So if you are, you know, of a particular tribe, you don't, you, you don't make the transition into, ma into manhood until you master certain things. So whenever we're working with the young men that we're working with, um, it's, it's not just because you're 16, 17, yeah, you can drive, but there's still some things that you need to learn about. You know, whether it's dealing with African American history, whether it's just talking and dealing with your parents and understanding gender roles. And understanding some things that because you are African American, there are some things that you may have to face as an African American. You know, so we try to teach them how to uh, deal with those things and be prepared to deal with them because you may be faced with a racial issue. And some of our young men have actually said that they, <coughs> excuse me, have experienced some of those things. Today, you know, we're talking 15, 16, 17 year olds. And so that's a part of what we do. You know, we are, we are there for them to either put them on the right path or help them stay on the right path and making that transition. It's like that rites of passage. We want to make sure that they are on the right passage into adulthood. Some guy who lives three blocks from here and his dad's gone or whatever, and so you try to train him up and teach him how to be a man. What do you get out of that? I think that there's an ongoing assassination of the black male image. And in the 100, we have a saying, what they see is what they'll be. And one, I've, I've, I've been brought up to carry myself in a certain manner. 
the Marine Corps added even more to that. But when people see the way that you carry yourself and you're that only male figure in their lives, whether it's just in the neighborhood or you're actually being a part of a mentoring program, if they don't have that male figure, I don't think a woman can teach a boy how to become a man. That doesn't mean that she can't teach him uh, the proper ways of growing up, but whenever it comes to dealing with that those gender things, it, it, it takes a man, so why not say, hey, let's